Hello, my friends, Takuya here, and welcome back to the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel. And also on that note, welcome back to Alexander the Great, The Making of a God. Or rather, I should say the critique slash analysis that we are doing of it, because after I know I did the trailer like several weeks ago and then subsequently traveled after that, which meant that even though I promised I would start breaking down this series before it managed to break me, I haven't actually done that yet. Or I guess when you watch this video, technically that means that I will have started it because that's what this is. Am I speaking? into the future right now. Anyway, for anyone who did not see the trailer video, yes, this is Alexander, The Making of a God, which is Netflix's new docudrama historical thing. I said this before in the beginning of that video, but these docudramas that Netflix has a tendency to create is this very weird combination of documentary and drama that kind of usually fails to fulfill both purpose. Not enough real history and too many things made up to be a documentary, but simultaneously rather stale and doesn't move along with the same kind of flair as what you would normally see with a drama. We all remember how Cleopatra and Jinga went. But as for Alexander, well, it begins here with the boy king. Now, my friends, I will say this right now. I'm sure that all of you are probably aware I'm not going to be able to go and actually play clips of this because I have no wish for the YouTube gods to come down and spite me where I sit. But what I will be doing is going through all the individual scenes here and kind of explaining what it is that is going on in a kind of summary while also pointing out where Netflix does things that is actually pretty good and other things where it is pretty not. So let's go ahead and dive into this now, shall we? Hey everyone, I am interrupting the video right now to let you know that this video is sponsored by me because I didn't have an advertisement to actually go up on this one. But either way, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is I love meeting up with people and going on fun adventures together. And to that end, what it is that we do is we typically try to host around two to three travel trips a year. And there are a couple of those that are coming up, with one of them that is happening this July where we are going to be going to Peru, and the other big one that just got announced is our trip to Germany. Or I say that, we're going to like Germany and Austria to the Christmas markets, we're going to be palaces, we're going to be going to all these kinds of things. Now, I say Germany, but it is Germany and Austria with two of the cities that we're going to out of the three actually being in Austria, which has been a point that a bunch of people have been making fun of here when I talk about this in the first place. Guys, we're going to be going to the Nymphenburg Palace, we're going to be going and walking around Munich and tasting wines, we're going to be exploring Salzburg and it's Christmas markets. We're going to be seeing fortresses. We're going to be seeing all kinds of things when we go. If you want to join us, then you're only required to actually put 25% down initially up front. And then past that point, they have six, 12 and 18 month payment options, which makes it a lot easier. But I still understand that there's going to be a lot of people who are not actually able to join us. They won't be able to afford that. Truthfully, if I wasn't hosting these things in the first place, then I wouldn't be able to just do these kinds of things. But I still try to do as many meetups as I can with local people. And one of the things that I'm doing is I'm getting more involved in LARPs. So if you want to join one of the events that I will be participating in, like in the case of The Reckoning, then by all means, go ahead and join us. I'm going to leave links down in the description below. Thank you, my friends, and I can't wait to go on many more adventures with all of you. First off, I'm going to say that I love how the opening shot going into this is that it specifically states, Netflix calls this a Netflix documentary series. Like, it's not saying docudrama. No, 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 no. Netflix, this is a documentary for you now, is it? Let's see how well you did then. Also, I feel the need to point out here that the very episode title that they're presenting here at the beginning, The Boy King, is something that feels a little bit weird. You're going to notice over the course of the series that what ends up happening is that Darius, the ruler of the Persians, he constantly refers to Alexander as just the boy, which doesn't really make sense as by the time that Alexander the Great takes charge in the armies, he is 20. And by any accounts, ancient and modern, that is a full-grown man. And when we talk about things being back in the ancient times where, you know, uh, people didn't exactly live very long, 20 years old, well, that was a man in the prime of his life. So this whole diminishing aspect of invented language calling Alexander a boy is not real. I, it, it feels weird to phrase it like that. Anyway, our story begins here at the Temple of Amun where you see something from the very beginning that is in each episode that I find rather interesting. For anyone who is unaware of Alexander the Great's history, he was proclaimed to be a demigod, at least as the story goes, to actually have been a son of Zeus by specifically the priests in Egypt. So what it's going and doing at the beginning of every episode and at the end is it's setting everything up in this massive kind of dramatic flair where this priestess, as you can see here, is telling the story of Alexander the Great, where she is expressing about how the world will collide and empires will fall and all of it hangs in the balance of two men, Alexander and Darius. 
And so when we look at that from the very beginning, the mystical aspects that it tries to show here, well, honestly, I, I actually don't really have much of a problem with this here. It, it's, it's kind of a nice little dramatic flair that Netflix puts on because specifically the whole, like everything about Alexander Great is something that is out of legends. The fact that he was able to do what it is that he did historically is like it was predestined by heaven itself. You could almost say, I'm not actually saying that that is the case, but to the people back in the day, that seemed like a very real possibility. So this, I'll grant them, is actually a bit of a cool dramatic touch that I don't really mind. The battle scenes though that it uh that, that it shows throughout all this here though is um we're going to get into a lot of those now here later. Anyway, the real beginning of the docudrama, so to speak, is actually quite strong. It starts off with different experts in the fields talking about Alexander the Great himself, talking about his impact, talk about his skills, his knowledge, everything, about how complex of a character he was. It even goes into archaeology in Alexandria, Egypt, where we get to actually see one of the sites that is being dug up with one of the many statues of Alexander the Great, of which there were many many, many thousands, one of these ends up being found here. And it's this really cool little dive that Netflix puts into something that is real. Like, it's not just a drama series. It's actually trying to express more of the history in the beginning, which I genuinely think is pretty cool. And yeah, here it is. You can actually see him pulling up the statue in there now. It was like this big monumentous event that they find it. And I really do like that. The actual drama of it all, the story that they begin to tell, that starts about five minutes in, where it first says that we encounter counter Alexander in 336 BC. It talks about how a year prior to the events that are about to take place that Alexander the Great had gone into exile, and it goes into a little bit of the story as to why that happened in the first place. If you hadn't seen the podcast episode that I did specifically on Alexander the Great, then you can go back and watch that to explain more, but also I'm probably going to be explaining a little bit of that now. Essentially, the gist of it is that he had to go into exile after he got into an argument with his father, who was drunk, and may have potentially tried to kill him like he he sided with one of his generals who was insulting Alexander over supporting his son so he's a 20 year old prince he has fled his father's kingdom he is in Illyria and this is where you get to first see an image of Alexander where he is having a sword fight with this guy who is Hephaestin Hephaestin is the individual that was Alexander the Great's best friend his greatest friend and also possibly his lover I say possibly he more than likely was some kind of lover or intimate partner of Alexander, but that's something that has created a little bit of controversy, which I'm going to explain that here in a second, but I also have to say here from the screenshot, you can see this behind me, it would not be a Netflix docudrama series without the experts behind them saying, and what I think he is trying to do in the scenario, what I think that he thinks, what I think, there's going to be a lot of conjecture and a lot of things that have to be extrapolated upon. This, to be fair, it's something that happens in history, it just happens a lot more in Netflix docudrama. Anyway, back to the whole Hephaestin lover thing. So Alexander and Hephaestin are having a sword fight. It gets just a little bit too intense. They have this big dramatic moment, this little tension that's in the air. And once they finish their fight, they go off to the river to wash. And it is there that uh, you, you actually end up seeing them share a kiss. Something that on the internet has caused a little bit of drama. Because there is still quite a bit of contention online as to whether or not Alexander the Great was gay or bi or really what his sexuality was in the first place. I'm sure that for anyone who is watching this right now, you've probably already seen a number of videos on this type of topic. So what I will simply say is that Netflix is not necessarily doing anything that is wrong here, no matter what any number of nationalist or religious hardliners, and I don't mean that in any way kind of insult, I mean specifically that there are certain places, like in the case of Greece, where people have actually gotten very mad over depictions of Alexander the Great being gay or bi or anything like that. There is actually a decent amount of textual evidence that Alexander shared relations with both men and women, that for all sense of the word, he appears to have actually been bi, with the relation that he had with Hephaestin being that of Erastes and Eronimos, which I know that I'm going to be butchering the pronunciation of, so on that note I apologize, but this was a concept that existed within Greek history that was the idea of the lover and the loved. Typically, the Erastes was the older, more dominant male who would take a younger male under his tutelage or friendship, and the Eromenos, or no, wait, no, Eromenos. It's Eromenos, isn't it? That was the youth that was loved, that was the object of attention and desire. And I'm talking about these specific titles, and 
I know that I'm spending a lot of time talking about this specific scene with this thing up here behind me, but it's very important to say this because people online actually have been angry about it. And for all intents and purposes, this is real. Could Netflix have done a little bit more hinting about it instead of just directly showing everything getting hot and heavy within the first like seven minutes? Yeah, they, they could have, but also they just went out with it right out of the gate because you know, they had every opportunity to be able to declare it and my God, did they take it. Go ahead and dislike this video if you're mad about that. I don't care. The thing is that's that's history. We can't really do anything to change that. Yeah, and it's uh, it, it, it gets a little, it gets pretty hot and heavy there. Anyway, it introduces Alexander's other friend, Ptolemy, who is one of his lifelong companions. And from there, they are going to move out and go to attend a wedding that this is where things get really wild. Because when they go back to Macedon for this royal wedding, it is that between Alexander's sister and what is then called in this, I know it's gonna pull up and it's kind of weird that they phrased this. Yeah, here it is. To one of the neighboring warlords. I, I, I don't know why it is that Netflix phrased things the way that it did here, because the person that Alexander's sister was marrying was not just a neighboring warlord, it was the ruler of Epirus, the, the neighboring state. And that guy, Alexander of Epirus, was in fact the brother of Olympias, who was Alexander's mother. I, I don't know why Netflix neglected to say that, because that, that it's a very crucial and important detail that we need to go in here that also shows the very increasingly complex family dynamics that are going to be faced in this entire situation. The whole thing, though, is not as incestuous as it sounds, because Olympias was the fourth wife of uh, Alexander's father, Ptolemy. Ptolemy would actually go on to have seven wives, so, you know, he, he got around. And marriage was something that Ptolemy would specifically use, as it says, in order to strengthen alliances, because he was a master of both warfare and diplomacy. So, Alexander arrives. This is where we get to first see his mother, Olympias. I don't really have all that much to say about her immediately, other than the fact that the giant piece of jewelry that she is wearing around her neck makes literally no sense whatsoever, because do you know what that thing is? Do you know what this giant pendant is? That is a Roman bulla, something that was like basically an amulet or a locket that, as it says here, was given to male children in ancient Rome nine days after birth. And it's like, it's literally right here. I don't know why this is around her neck. I'm I, I, I don't know if this was like used from another type of movie or from a series or what, but that, uh, that, that, that doesn't really make much sense to be around a middle-aged woman's neck. So yeah, a little bit off from the get-go. Anyway, moving on from that, Alexander, of course, reunites with his mother. There's this whole discussion about, you know, him returning to his place of honor because that's really the question of what exactly is going to happen. And there's this little moment of possible foreshadowing where she says, all will be made right soon enough. You shall see, which for anyone watching this or anyone who knows history, that's a direct implication of what is going to happen, but I do kind of like how Netflix does manage to keep some of it at least a little bit open-ended, because what happens, we, we, we still don't actually know. The historians and experts in this do actually explain the complex relationship of Olympias, that she was at one point the favored wife of Philip, and now she seems to be almost unwanted. She is a woman who is cunning, she is powerful, she's intelligent, she knows exactly what needs to be done in order to get power, potentially, and that's how it is that they're setting her up, and it, it, it kind of, they kind of it seemed to imply that she has a lot to gain if Philip was to disappear, which, I mean, technically she does. Now, before it goes and properly shows Philip, they do have the historians go in and explain why Alexander was sent into exile in the first place, the whole drunken incident with his father and everything that happened there. So I, I, I get that. Like, all that is fine. They just explain what it is that I already explained. The big thing that bothers me here, where it looks, oh my God, this, this really does piss me off, is that the actual representation that it has here of Philip II is terrible. Literally, none of this, none of this makes any sense for Philip. I want you to look at this image that is up here on the screen right now, and then I want you to look at an artist's rendition of what Philip more likely looked like. Um, yes, way more grizzled. Uh, notice there is a massive scar that is going across his face right here, and in full armor, with a beard. Yeah, the funny thing about Philip II of Macedon was that he was actually only one-eyed because in a battle, like, he had actually lost one of his eyes, which gave him a very striking appearance and that, that that's that's not demonstrated here it doesn't show any of this instead this kind of looks like just your kind of happy distant uncle if anything else also i have to go back on this here when it first introduces philip ii in the first place where is that gotta go back a little bit more here we go when you actually see the scene of him walking by and i'm not going to play it because i know that netflix is going to get mad at me he is walking by with a perfect gait nothing is wrong there is a very obvious and easy thing that netflix could have done here just for just a little bit of flair just a little bit of flair and that is that 
Philip had one really bad leg, which again, he had specifically because of a war injury, something that never properly healed. It wasn't going to. This is something that when we actually did discover Philip II's actual tomb, we were able to prove definitively that he did have this injury in war because the skeleton had those same deformities that were described in all the texts. The representation that it gives of him immediately here is just, it, it, it's nothing. It's nothing. There's no impact. There's nothing to it that actually shows this really powerful leader. And I know I'm getting really agitated about something so simple when this is Alexander the Great, but it, it genuinely does bother me because there are simple things that can be done to make things look better. Anyway, there's this whole point about Attalus, that general, and the issue that led to his exile in the first place. He says that it doesn't matter that Alexander is still his son. And from here, they actually do go and reconcile. Though at the same time, I do have to pause to go ahead and say that the amount of times that they shorten names in this to say things like Alex and Toll and other stuff is just, it's really weird because that's that's not how the names would have worked at all like they don't have the same kind of shortenings back then that they do nowadays so again another little inaccuracy just Netflix putting in some modern lingo for things but again either way Alexander and his father do reconcile in the scene all of it is accurate this does appear to be happening and Alexander is set at this point to go and join his father in war that Phil Philip II is supposed to be leading a campaign against the Persians, and Alexander is going to be going with him. It's supposed to be this huge point here at the wedding that this is something that's going to be happening, and Alexander is preparing for it. All good. And finally here, we get to the big dramatic moment, the, the point in which Alexander truly becomes king, and he does this when one of Philip II's bodyguards goes and assassinates him. This is not Netflix doing anything for dramatic effect. No, that, that is something that did legit happen. That, that actually did happen. Pausanias, who was one of Philip II's bodyguards, and maybe possibly possibly lover, if not best friend, had some kind of falling out. We don't exactly know why. We don't know what. We don't know the absolute truth of the matter. He goes and assassinates Philip, possibly at the direction of Olympias, but we, we, we don't know. We don't know. Even though Netflix is going to imply pretty heavily that it was her, and it very well could have been, that's not 100% true, but also we can't say that it's false. We literally don't know. It's one of those more confusing points in history. Anyway, when this happens, Alexander goes and takes center stage. He takes his father's equipment. He he addresses the crowd, and he specifically blames the Persians for this assassination. And he uses it as an effort in order to try and unite people behind him against the common enemy that they are all to face, Persia. Again, all of this legitimate. Netflix so far has done a pretty good job in the beginning of storytelling with this in comparison to anything that we'd previously seen with both Cleopatra and Jinga. There's been way less drama, even if dramatic events are definitely still unfolding. Which then brings us to the conflict, and the experts then go and talk about the Persian Empire, how big and glorious it was, how it was the largest empire in the ancient world there, at least in the Western world to this point, that had ever been known. We get to see fantastical scenes of ziggurats, we get to see Darius, who is depicted it over here, his wife, and I forget the individual that this right here was supposed to be. The interesting thing when they talk about Darius here is that even though he is the ruler of the Persians, simultaneously he actually entered into power in a similar structure to the way that Alexander did. The two previous rulers of Persia had been poisoned, I think it was. And so although he wasn't directly in line to the throne, he would marry his wife, Satira, and she had a closer connection to the royal family. She was of royal blood, and that is the thing that actually gave him his legitimacy. Thus, he and Alexander are, even though they are worlds apart, simultaneously in somewhat similar circumstances. What I do actually particularly like about this, though, is the mention that they have in here of when talking about building a temple, we have the money it arrived from Egypt yesterday. That is something that has begun to become hugely important in the series as time goes on, because historically, Egypt has, for most empires, been a massive moneymaker, a breadbasket, everything. It was a hugely rich province, and that is something that specifically provides provided a lot of the wealth for empires that controlled it. This is one of the key reasons as to why later on, Alexander, instead of marching on Babylon and actually moving east, would first move south to try and take Egypt, to secure it. It's a little random note, but I actually do like that they included this in here. Either way, things move back to Alexander and the consolidation that he has to do after taking power, because things actually are a little bit more complex after this. He doesn't immediately take the fight to Persia, because that's not going to be possible for him at this point. The historians then go on to talk about how Olympias, Alexander's mother, had the potential rivals to the throne killed, which may, may possibly have happened. 
some of them may have either offed themselves or they may have, you know, been offed. You know, that's something that could definitely happen, but we don't necessarily know for certain. And I'm not going to describe the gruesome ways that they're describing on here. They can kind of see it on the screen because I have no wish for YouTube to take any of this down. And even though we don't know that Olympias did any of these things, there is reasonable suspicion to suspect that she did. And Netflix goes and runs with it saying that, yeah, she she did it. I'm not going to be mad at that. It's, it, you can't really do much else. Either way, it moves back into Persia, and this is where we get to see a rather interesting sight. You see this moment of the Persians, which I, I still don't know why they are doing the whole thing with the full head wraps. This, no, no, and you're not, you're not going to see that on all the soldiers either. Like that, that's just we we discussed this. We discussed this in the trailer. This is not what they did for head wraps. But either way, it shows them playing a kind of polo game here, which we're not able to confirm necessarily if they didn't play something that was similar, but there were ball games that appeared to have been played from horseback that had been done in ancient times all across the region here. So this is a thing that possibly did happen. The armor though, the, the armor. Now that's, um, oh my God, these freaking headdresses here. For anyone who did not see when I did the reaction for the trailer when I saw this, uh, yeah, no, the whole cap with turban thing in here, something that you would not see until the Islamic armies of like the 11th and 12th century. Yeah, Netflix is a good 1500 years into the future with this this whole setup, that's that's not a thing. And moving on from that, when they introduce Memnon, this is, okay, this is something that I've noticed already repeatedly over the course of the series, but it, it, what is with all the leather? Like, wh what is this armor? What, what, what is this, what are these studs here on the side? What What is any of this stuff? This straight up is leather. Like, hold on, let me go, let me go back on this here for a second. All the way back to where, where's Alexander? Nope, not that scene. The man here on top of the rough clothing that he's already wearing appears to be also wearing some kind of leather, or I don't even know, what is this? Why does does it look like mulch that has been plated onto his skin? What, what, what is this? It looks like the armor from like the TV show Vikings, like all this leather stuff with the intricate little straps and all the little designs on it here that they brought forth. And it looks like they tried to age it by a good one or 2,000 years, which again would seem very odd considering that we're talking about something that is uh, taking place way further in the past. If like the, the department tried to reuse props from other shows or something. I mean, to be fair, we know that they're probably reusing something considering otherwise she wouldn't be wearing literal Roman jewelry. Like there's no reason for her to have this for a production that should have been meant for a Greek show or Macedonian. They pulled this from something out of like the Hellenistic or or Roman plots from some other production, I'm sure. Anyway, it is here that Memnon has told Darius that the Macedonians have attacked, though at this point, Alexander the Great hasn't actually joined them. It is under the command of, let's see, what general? It's Atlas and Parmenian. And God, you could just see it all in the combo here. Like the turban, turban, the armor, like the, the, the whole setup here, the armor here. It looks so out of place. It's just, it does not fit whatsoever. I will say this though, in comparison to what we saw with Njinga or Cleopatra or anything else like that, I've noticed at least significantly less drama just for the sake of drama in the dialogue, which is something that I do genuinely appreciate. So that is something that as much criticism as I am giving is still better than what we have previously seen. At least so far, it's the first episode. Either way, Memnon gets ordered to gather his mercenaries and go attack the Macedonian forces that are amassing there on Western Anatolia. And it is here that we get to a rather weird scene. So what happens in this is that Olympias calls her son, Alexander, into a room where she proceeds to tell him his true origins after having some type of hallucinogenic drink, that he is not, in fact, the mortal son of Philip II, that he is actually the son of the Greek god Zeus. Like, he, he, he is the son of the chief deity and that he is destined for greatness. And it is here that he goes into some kind of trance afterwards, gets gets transported to another realm and witnesses his destiny in front of Mount Olympus. And the amount of drama that they input into this one scene is insane, especially considering that we don't actually know if Alexander genuinely believed that he was the son of a god or not. Certainly, as time went on, he became more full of himself as his campaigns actually progressed, but the stories of Olympias telling Alexander that he was actually the son of a god, this seems to all be stuff that would have been added in hundreds of years after his death to the stories rather than occurring now. The closest example that we possibly have of him actually 
actually thinking that he is a god is when he act, when he goes down to Egypt. Not here, not at the beginning of his campaigns, not believing that he is destined for all of this greatness immediately. So Netflix is then really leaning hard into the whole making of a god aspect. Like, it, this is going to have a lot of supernatural tones to it. They go back to the Persians, they talk about omens, how it is that things would be interpreted, and all of this is real. That's definitely something that the Persians were obsessed with, was reading the stars and being able to predict things and omens. But again, all ancient peoples were. The Persians just took this a little bit further than some from their advanced culture that they had managed to accrue over time. But it's here that we get to something that actually does make me a little bit upset because it was done, I know this, specifically in order to just help the story along and create drama and did not actually happen. What they're talking about here is that there is a Macedonian general that they know does not like Alexander and what Satira suggests to her husband is that he send a letter, a bribe, that if he turns on Alexander, he'll make him the like, king of Macedon. Like He'll support him in this rule, right? It's just something that would be able to turn the Greeks upon themselves. Which I'm not faulting the strategy, that is a smart strategy, that is certainly a really cool thing, if that had actually happened, but it didn't. They specifically say in the show here that Darius reaches out to Atlas in order to try and bribe him, and that, that didn't happen. No, it wasn't the Persians, it was the Greeks. People don't really understand this here at the time, and I'm gonna actually try and pull it up here. But while Macedon may have been a smaller kingdom, simultaneously they did rule over the Greeks as not vassals per se, though some were vassals in terms of relations, it's more like they were were the leaders of a collective alliance where they were the biggest brother among all of them. And the Greeks did not really like the Macedonians. Many of them viewed the Macedonians as outsiders, as not actually being Greek, no matter how it is that the royalty of Macedonia tried to ascribe themselves. So it was actually a guy from Athens down here who had sent a letter to Attalus that was trying to get him to turn against Alexander, not the Persians. And he was just one of many people down in Greece that was was actually trying to revolt against Alexander. This is why for the first couple years, Alexander could not actually invade Persia. He had to turn around and continuously invade south into Greece, up north, south again. He had to continuously do this to try and quell the people and put them back under Macedonia's boot. But it skips all of this. It skips all of it entirely. It doesn't address any of it. It only says that the Persians did this action. And from this, he's able to unite all the peoples against them with the assassination of his father. And no, that didn't happen. Either way, although the origin of the letter is something that is definitely wrong, the actions that would come afterward are true. So what Attalus does is he sends a letter to Alexander with it showing, hey, this is the thing that I'm receiving as like a show of loyalty to show Alexander that he is going to be loyal to Macedon. He is not going to accept the Persian bribe. But Alexander, seeing a potential time here that he can get rid of an enemy that has been a thorn in his side, Attalus, the guy who caused him to go into exile in the first place, his niece was actually one of the people that in Alexander's process of consolidating his rule, Olympias may have had killed. So he was always something that potentially could have been an enemy, and considering the bad history that they already had together, yeah, he wasn't going to keep around this potentially loyal general and instead have him um, finished off. Either way, it's going to move back to our priestess lady who's going to talk about how the world is set to collide as both powers are gearing up for this fight. We get to see the shot of Alexander leading his forces out of the city, and the world is waiting with bated breath as to what is going to happen next. Again, I can see th this looks more like padded down here for the armor here. I don't have as much of an issue with this because I remember we already did an analysis of this in the trailer. And overall, the armor that we see on him, though drab in color, is actually pretty decent. Here, at least in this shot, we can see see what appears to be some pikes, so that's a pretty good thing, but then also on top of that, the armor and helmets in this look terrible. But hey, at least they have pikes, so that's a good thing. Considering what I saw in later battles here and how it actually shows things in the trailer, ah, uh, well, that's that's not happening yet. Darius receives word that Atlas is dead, and the next episode is set to begin. Death or victory? So all in all, my friends, I think what I'm going to go ahead and do is end things here today. We're going to do an analysis of the next episode, definitely, but also looking at this, I have to say that in comparison to 
to what we saw with Njinga in comparison to what we saw with Cleopatra, the setup for Alexander is at least better than what I had seen with those. It still runs into the same kind of problem of over-dramatizing things that don't need to be dramatized, but also at the moment that this is happening, there is actually quite a bit of drama. So the dialogue is not as clunky as what we had previously seen. The armor, of course, does not look good, but we're going to be seeing much more of that in later episodes as time goes on, I'm sure. And simultaneously, the way that they've changed certain parts of history in order to make it so that things are more dramatic, that everything is set up specifically between Darius and Alexander, when that hasn't really happened yet, they completely skip over everything that was happening down in southern Greece. They completely skip over all the revolts that were occurring in Thrace and to the north. They, they skip over everything that makes Alexander from just this little boy king, as they're trying to phrase it in here, into an actual competent commander that was actually battle-tested and proven in his political savvy and everything before he even invades Persia in the first place. They're setting it up like he's completely untried and untested and is moving in, and that's not true. They're trying to set him up as more of an underdog than what he actually was in the beginning, which, don't get me wrong, he was an underdog. Absolutely he was, but they're making it even more of that case than he actually was. And I don't really like that. But either way, my friends, it's time for us to finish things off here. Thank you very much for watching. This has been Stakuyi with the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel, and I ask that you join me here on the next one for Alexander the Great. Once I finish the series, I'm going to be going in and doing the Shogun series, which I'm actually hearing quite a number of positive things about. So we're going to do a trailer reaction to that, and then we are going to then go in and start analyzing the series to kind of set everything up. Goodbye, my friends. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you all have a good rest of your day.